Hello everybody, it's Wyvern here with another historical video. Now this time around we are going to be covering a topic that is quite different from our usual fare, uh, because rather than covering Warhammer versus history here or even military history, I'm actually going to be covering Plague, more specifically the Black Death and the impact it had on European containment me measures, uh, European quarantining methods, as well as European medical practices. Uh, and the reason why I decided to make a video on this is largely influenced by current events. Obviously, I suspect most people watching, if not everybody watching, know that the coronavirus has been a big thing, has had quite a disruptive impact on just about everything. Uh, chances are, if you're watching this video, you've had it disrupt some of your day-to-day -day life, at least to an extent. Uh, so, in light of that, I felt it would be good for me to go back to some of the uh, historical writing I had done back in undergrad, some of the essays I'd written and research papers I'd done in regards to the Black Death and the impact it had on on these uh, sort of containment methods within uh, within Europe. Um, now, I know many of you are more interested in, perhaps in military history and that sort of thing, and those videos will be going up. I do have a follow-up video to the repeater crossbow uh, vid uh, covering organ guns which will be coming up later, but I really felt like covering this topic of uh, plague containment and just felt that it would be appropriate given, given current events. Uh, hopefully you guys do find this informative. I'm not sure how enjoyable or entertaining it may be, but hopefully it's at least a little bit informative, a little bit educational. Um, be sure to leave your own thoughts, opinions, comments, and critiques down below. As usual, I will try to respond as soon as I can. Uh, and I think if you have any additional information or points you'd like to make, uh, I think it's always great to sort of uh, share knowledge and just uh, spread, spread the knowledge base a bit. So hopefully you guys do find this uh, interesting. And without further ado, let's dive into the Black Death and the impact it had on European medicine and quarantine. Now, before we dive into the European response to the Black Death, um, I think it is important to uh, discuss a little bit of the history of the disease uh, as well as uh, the exact impact it had. Uh, now, the Black Death was a bacterial disease that is believed to have been around for thousands of years, uh, with some of the earliest examples now discovered by researchers dating back to 3000 BC. Now, more pertinent to the mid-14th century occurrence of the Black Death, uh, there were records in the East, and especially Central Asia in the area of Kyrgyzstan, where uh, the Black Death was reported um, as early as the 1330s. Um, and the Black Death, this plague, uh, actually ravaged much of Asia, uh, cent um, Central Asia, East Asia, South Asia, and uh, much of the Middle East long before it ever touched European shores. Uh, millions died in China, the Middle East, India, uh, in these areas, uh, long before the plague was even known in Europe, uh, long before the first reports in 1346 came in, uh, mentioning the depopulated areas of this Middle East and India uh, that had been sort of struck by this plague. Now, the plague itself did not reach Europe until 1346 or 1347, depending which what the exact date was is not entirely known, uh, but those are the speculated dates. Um, one of what the source of these the disease was is not entirely known either. Uh, there are some claims that it was simply traders traversing the Silk Road. Uh, others mention, and perhaps the most famous story I've seen is that of Genoese ships uh, leaving the Crimean port of Kaffa, uh, fleeing the uh, the um, Mongol siege of that city taking the disease with them because supposedly the Mongols were firing corpses infected with the disease into the city perimeter and uh, as a result the Genoese unfortunately took the disease with them uh, and spread it from Sicily uh, into the rest of Europe once they returned from uh, Kaffa. Now whether or not this was the case, whether or not it was a combination of different transmitters bringing the disease in, not entirely known, uh, but it is the the fact that the disease spread from there is well documented. Uh, by 1347, the disease had struck most of Italy, and um, by 1351, it had reached Eastern Europe. Uh, and in those in that time period, it wiped out as much as 50% of the European population. Um, the disease also did not simply stop in 1351. It did not simply stop in the mid 14th century. It would continue to reoccur for decades thereafter, and in fact, centuries thereafter. Uh, with um, at least one outbreak supposedly being recorded on a yearly basis. Um, 
In fact, there are some rec records of the Black Death as recently as modern day. Uh, now, obviously, with modern day sanitation, with modern day medicine, it's nowhere near the mass killer it was in the mid 14th century. However, it is still absolutely a fatal disease. It's still potentially a lethal disease. Uh, it is still a dangerous disease, and it still exists, um, even though very rare, fortunately. Now, what the exact reasons for the spread of the disease were is not entirely known. Obviously, the disease was famously carried, um, or the bacteria for the disease were famously carried in, uh, in fleas, which were being carried on rats. Now, it is worth noting that um, it was not simply rats that carried these fleas. Um, marmots and other rodents carried them in Central Asia. Uh, the fleas also found their way onto items such as cloth, uh, and from there would be tr often be transmitted uh, throughout Europe. It was not simply rats spreading the plague. There, there were other sources for it as well. Uh, now, why exactly it was so successful in spreading is a combination of factors, really. Uh, poor sanitation, of course, was one, uh, but it was also not helped by the fact that international trade had increased significantly in Europe with a certain sort of return of stability in Europe. Of course, the st stability was very re relative, uh, but with the return of some stability in Europe, there was an increase in international trade. Um, of course, it was are believed perhaps to be trading ships that had even brought the disease to Europe in the first place. Um, there was also the fact that wars uh, as in Europe afflicted the population rather heavily. Um, wars such as the conflicts such as the Hundred Years' War, of course, did not help to the resistance to this plague, uh, and resulted, in, of course, resulted in famines. Um, Mal malnutrition among the populace weakened them to the effects of disease uh, and uh, that simply was a cocktail of bad influences that only served to make the plague more disastrous. Uh, the disease also took some time to manifest um, and it was in fact likely that by the time the first infected person had died um, the disease had probably spread to others uh, even before it had been noted uh, that, that a person was sick. Um, and so this was a big issue. Uh, the fact that the disease was also carried by rats uh, meant that people were often caught unawares by the uh, re emergence or even re-emergence of the disease. Uh, fleas would often die throughout in the winter and then rats would sort of hide and wait, wait out the cold. Um, and so people would think that the plague was done and that the plague was over. Then spring would come in and the rats would re-emerge, the fleas would re-emerge and as a result, the plague would spread once more. Uh, and this was sort of a cocktail of disaster. And as a result, the loss of life was devastating. Uh, the damage to society and um, and all and the nations afflicted was massive. And uh, this was not limited to Europe. I think it is important to note. Uh, the, this was something... This disease afflicted China incredibly heavily. It inflicted India. It, infl it inflicted really much. Of, I shouldn't even just mention a few nations. It afflicted really most of Asia. It afflicted a massive chunk of the Middle East. It aff affected much of North Africa and Europe. It was not a disease limited to just these few nations, ju to just a handful of nations. And um, it had incredibly deleterious effects on these nations, on these cultures, on these peoples, and millions died. It is believed that as much as a quarter of the world's population died due to the Black Death, which is just devastating, um, and really uh, basically an incomparable sort of uh, loss of life and percentage. Uh, now, the responses, however, uh, to the disease were very varied, and that's really what we're going to be examining here in this video. Now, when one hears mention of the response to the Black Death. I think many of the images that immediately come to mind are ones of a very inept or perhaps confused or knee-jerk response. Uh, of course, examples such as flagellants or infamous, uh, with people marching in the streets, uh, whipping themselves, uh, seeking to atone for their sins, searching for God's forgiveness, uh, believing that the plague was, in fact, divine punishment uh, for humanity sinning or perhaps for humanity turning away from God. Uh, other examples of this response, you, we have plague doctors, uh, individuals oftentimes with little or no medical training, uh, even by the standards of the day, 
uh, wearing ridiculous bird masks, loaded with herbs, giving people dreadful medical advice, uh, and really not helping at all. Or perhaps you see mention of the pogroms, uh, where many European popula uh, European Christian populations accused um, Jewish communities near them for uh, sort of causing the disease or for spreading the disease or for being the source of the disease. Um, and uh, as, as a result, uh, hundreds of pogroms took place and uh, thousands of people were slain. Um, the Jewish communities in, in Europe uh, were, were devastated by these pogroms. And this was despite the efforts of the Catholic Church to intervene and prevent the pogroms. The Pope himself attempted to intervene in this uh, and to no avail. Mob violence prevailed. Uh, hundreds of communities were effectively annihilated and thousands were murdered. Uh, or perhaps you hear mentions of those who fled the plague uh, and of the panic and the terror and the uncertainty that was rampant. Um, for example, in Boccaccio's Decameron, uh, one can read about how those, especially the wealthy individuals or the, those in the affluent classes, sought to flee from the plague. and They hoped to find refuge in the rural, rural countryside or perhaps went to far off towns and abandoned those trapped in the cities to their fates. Uh, another example in, in Marcio, Marcion Bunati's notes in his Florentine Chronicles, he writes of how sons abandoned fathers, husbands, wives, wives, husbands, one brother the other, one sister the other. And in this passage, we see just how badly society is falling apart, how, how desperate people were, how terrified they were, and uh, how the plague incited so much terror that people were literally abandoning family uh, to, to their fates. And uh, it definitely paints a bleak picture and a, and a rather terrifying picture of what Europe's response was to the plague. However, I think it's important that one's wary of translating these well-known and these publicized occurrences and then using them to create a generalization of what happened in Europe over the course of the century, really, uh, after the plague initially re reared its head. Um, and, and throughout, especially the century following the Black Death, one saw repeated reoccurrences. And um, I think the response we see is not necessarily the one that immediately jumps to mind if one were to think of these publicized occurrences. And that is not to downplay them. That is not to claim they did not happen. Yes, many people fled and um, it was a very common occurrence. Yes, pogroms took place. Hundreds of pogroms took place. Uh, and the impact there was devastating. The loss of life was terrible. Uh, and of course, yes, there were flagellants in the streets. And yes, there were ridiculous plague doctors. However, once again, one, I think it's important to avoid generalization uh, when discussing the response that was taken uh, by Europe in this time period. Now, perhaps one of the most basic and the mo really the most ruthless measures taken to prevent the spread of the plague was that of quarantine. Now, the idea of separating the ill from the healthy was not altogether new in Europe. Uh, most significantly, perhaps, leper colonies had been in existence for centuries and even millennia before the advent of the Black Death. However, the quarantine itself was a new measure and one that found its origins during the 1370s. The word itself evolved from the Italian word 40 days, and this was the traditional time period uh, for which those who were afflicted by the plague uh, or came from plague-afflicted areas would be kept separated from society, segregated from society, uh, so that it could be determined if they were afflicted or not. Um, now, or if, and see if they were still sort of transmitting the plague or not. Now, as early as 1374, we see that Viscount Bernabo from Reggio in Italy ordered that all those afflicted with the disease be removed from to the countryside to recover or die. And this is really one of the earliest instances of this sort of uh, quarantining style effort um, and is really sort of a, uh, in many ways, terrifying example of the ruthlessness employed. Um, but at the same time, it does show the uh, sort of um, terrible choices that were uh, forced on authorities by the uh, advent of this plague that could potentially have absolutely devastating uh, consequences for, a, for any uh, populace. Now, 
1377, we see in the port of Ragusa, which is modern-day Dubrovnik in um, Croatia, uh, the quarantine would actually become more extreme, and it would actually be properly institutionalized. Uh, now, originally, a man named Jacob of Padua, who was the city's chief physician, uh, and that's kind of the equivalent of a doctor at the time, he recommended that a sort of field hospital uh, should be established at outside of the city limits uh, to take care of those who were suffering the plague. So there was certainly a more humane method being employed here than the one displayed by Bernabo in Reggio. Uh, and it's clear that they, they wanted to sort of try to cure people, but at the same time knew it's important to separate them from society to prevent the spread of plague further. Now, shortly thereafter, the city's Grand Council enacted a more rigorous and more defined method of containment, uh, which was initially known as Trentino, or 30 days in Italian. Uh, now, in uh, the work Origins of Quarantine, uh, Clinical Infectious Diseases by uh, Philip Matskoviak and uh, Paul Sedev, uh, we see them list out the uh, four tenets of this early uh, Grand Council law that was passed. Uh, first and foremost, the citizens or visitors from plague endemic areas uh, would not be admitted into Ragusa until they were isolated or had stayed month in isolation. Second of all, that no person from Ragusa was permitted to go to these isolation areas with the penalty that if they went there, they'd be stuck there for 30 days. Third of all, that persons who were not assigned by the Grand Council to care for those being uh, isolated uh, were not permitted to bring food to the isolated individuals uh, under the penalty of remaining there for a month. And uh, fourth of all, that whoever didn't observe these regulations would be fined, and as I sort of already mentioned, would then be subject to a month of isolation. Uh, so it's clear that they were taking this issue very seriously, uh, and they were hoping to stimmy the progress of the plague at all costs. Now, over the course of the next century, other Italian city-states joined in on the method, uh, with Marseille, Venice, Genoa, and Pisa all enacting their own forms of this sort of early quarantine system. Uh, and in fact, it became known as the Quarantino during this later time period, um, due to the fact that the prescribed period of isolation was stretched to 40 days. Now, why exactly this is the case is not known, and it's hotly debated. Uh, some of the ex examples or claimed, uh, claimed uh, explanations I've seen uh, include uh, religious ones. For example, the 40-day observation of Lent or the significance of the number 40 in the days Moses spent on Mount Sinai, Jesus, the days Jesus spent in the wilderness, or even the duration of the Great Flood. Uh, in the opinion of others, uh, the 40-day duration stemmed from an ancient Greek belief, and at the time, uh, much uh, Greek medicine was sort of seen as the basis of all European and really all legitimate medicine. So it was believed that... Uh, uh, the, uh, by the Greeks that it would take a disease 40 days to manifest itself and it's believed that the quarantine the 40-day ideas came from that otherwise perhaps from a purely cynical practical perspective that 30 days was just not enough time to spend quarantine that it was decided that 40 days was a more appropriate time period and one that would actually sort of um, allow a more decisive way of figuring out if someone was infected or not um, regardless, the exact truth does remain undiscovered, and it's still contested to date, and we're still not entirely sure what the case was. What is, however, known is that quarantine caught on, and it, it stuck around and sticks around to modern day, as we can see taking place even now with the coronavirus. But uh, more importantly to the Black Death, um, we see that when, when the plague struck the village of Eum in the 17th century, uh, the authorities there immediately took the measure, or as soon as the plague was discovered, they took the measure uh, that of, of a uh, quarantine. Um, and they isolated the town from the outside. Uh, they purchased supplies from the outside world by cleaning uh, gold coins with vinegar so as to sanitize them, leaving those coins at, on the outskirts of the town at a pre-designated rendezvous to get supplies from the outside world, but at the same time preventing contact with the outside world and thus uh, controlling the spread of the plague. Now, it was sort of an act of extreme self-sacrifice. Uh, the small town of Eam ended up being ravaged and hundreds of people died, but the disease didn't transmit outwards. And um, it, it does show how the quarantine could be in a very efficient method of control, uh, even if uh, perhaps terrifying and, and uh, certainly uh, uh, potentially very, very uh, 
brutal method, but it could be a very effective method of controlling the plague, and it continued to be a method used uh, for centuries thereafter to control the Black Death, really kind of a go-to method of trying to control it. Now, the, this quarantining of outsiders um, or, or of cities was not um, simply the only uh, method implemented. Um, we also see the uh, example of travel restrictions limiting citizens within states and within cities uh, from traveling outwards and then returning with the plague. For example, in the city of Pistoia, it was ordained that um, no citizen of uh, Pistoia should presume to go to Pisa or Lucca or any county or district of these towns or cities. Uh, and this, this comes from the Ordinances for Sanitation in a Time of Mortality in the year 1348. So we see these um, bans on outside travel taking place long before the quarantine even uh, became a thing. And uh, so travel restrictions were one of the major uh, steps taken to try and contain uh, the, the plague. Uh, and it was only through special papers that an individual from, for example, Pistoia could travel out of the city and then return. Otherwise, you would simply be banned from coming back. Uh, now, one of the final notes I think to make is, of course, the note of trade, and more specifically, the sort of movement of goods and what was allowed, what was not allowed, and uh, how it was contained. Uh, for example, we saw in the case of Eam, vinegar was used to clean coins that were being used to pay outsiders. Um, perhaps this would, was not, given that the plague was being transmitted through fleas, this may not have been efficient, but it, it shows a sort of effort to take sanitary precautions in regard to items that could potentially, when, when populations were not sure of what was the cause, they took sort of all precautions um, to try to prevent the spread. And we see similar cases in Italian towns in the 14th century. Um, now, it's clear in these examples that the exact cause or the means of transmission for the plague were unknown. There were speculative, speculative thoughts on that it was carried through the air, uh, for example, but it was not known. Uh, however, authorities made efforts to limit goods that were suspect. For example, in the early days of the epidemic in Florence, uh, it was decided that all harmful fruit, in which included uh, unripe plums, unripe almonds, fresh beans, figs, and other inessential unhealthy fruit, were forbidden from entering the city, uh, which comes from the Florentine Chronicles, uh, written by Marcion di Stefano. Now, we now know that the disease was not carried by foodstuffs, but, uh, but through rat-borne fleas and through cloth-borne fleas. Uh, but it's readily apparent uh, that uh, so it's readily apparent that this measure would have been ineffective, but it does display a clear understanding, I think, among authorities that the plague had to be coming from somewhere, and they got to deal with all potential sources. Um, now, in the case of the city of Pistoia, we do see better awareness in regards to the source of the problem, uh, and a ban was actually placed on cloth imports. So in the Ordinance for Sanitation, uh, we do see the uh, restrictions being placed on any clothing, uh, whether linen or woolen, uh, on the penalty of a, a fiscal uh, of a fiscal fine um, being banned uh, from the city of Pistoia, uh, as well as all districts and counties around the city. Um, the only cloth that they were allowed to uh, bring in was either um, their own cl the clothes on their backs or a small bundle weighing 30 pounds or less. So this was already a more sensible take. It, obviously, rats were one of the keys to moving the fleas, but it's also noted that many of these fleas would live in the cloth, otherwise perhaps the rats would try to hide in the cloth, um, and uh, such fabric had uh, would in fact later bring, the it's believed to bring the plague to Eam. So this would have been a perhaps effective manner of restricting the plague outside of simply quarantining. Uh, now, we can, uh, now we can also read um, from the uh, C, from the CDC, from the American CDC, that um, there were also procedures uh, designed to purge various products, um, and these were often uh, and and products that were likely to transmit the disease, such as wool, yarn, cloth, leather, wigs, and blankets. Um, and amongst the treatments recommended, uh, it included the uh, continuous ventilation, uh, wax, and um, 
and using uh, wax, uh, wax or a sponge uh, or a sponge immersed in running water uh, for 48 hours. Um, and uh, so it's clear, I think, here that there was at least some that there were at least some cool heads that, in spite of all the devastation and death that was wrought by the plague, uh, made an attempt to narrow down the issue and implement methods to uh, restrict the transmission of the plague or to clean products that could have been carrying the plague um, and uh, sort of prevent the plague from having too dev from uh, sort of prevent the plague from from spreading too easily and um, some of these measures obviously not that effective most likely um, other others of these measures actually proved relatively efficient or effective and uh, certainly worth mentioning now really the final series of regulations that I think it is worth discussing in uh, the light of the Black Death are those concerning the disposal and treatment of, bo of bodies and uh, corpses. Uh, obviously as the plague reached full tilt towards the um, 14, towards the 1450s and um, towards the latter portion of the 1440s, the number of bodies kept piling higher and the amount of healthy individuals capable of disposing of them was continuously dropping. Um, there were simply too many dead, and of the survivors, many were all were themselves weakened by the plague or perhaps by other diseases or, or uh, malnourishment and those sorts of things, or they were otherwise simply unwilling to dispose of the bodies for fear of themselves contracting the plague, uh, whether through contact or through the air and through the, from the stench and so on of the corpses. And this gave governments a serious issue uh, the, of how to dispose of the dead. Uh, and as a result, uh, many measures were taken to dispose of them en masse. Um, for example, a lot of bodies were dumped into the River Rhone um, simply to dispose of them quickly and efficiently because the resources were not there to dispose of them in a more proper manner. Um, and as a result, in fact, the Pope uh, at the time, Pope Clement VI, actually consecrated the river as a final resting place for those who were dying of the plague. Um, furthermore, restrictions were implemented as to the depth at which bodies were to be buried. Uh, we see in Italy in particular these restrictions taking place. For example, in Pistoia, it was decreed that all bodies had to be buried to a depth of two and a half brachia. Now, I'm personally not sure which variant of brachia Pistoia utilized. Um, for those of you who don't know, brachia was a unit of measurement utilized by quite a few different Italian city-states and Italian cities. However, Due, there was no exact uniformity to the measurement, and it varied both by to an extent by time period as well as by city state. Um, however, it would have been somewhere between four and six feet depth uh, in depth, and this was to largely to prevent the stench of the bodies, because it was believed that the disease was being transferred through the air. Uh, but we do see some of these um, more modern, essentially, approaches to disposing of bodies with with, uh, restri with restrictions on how deep they must be buried and that sort of thing taking place in the midst of the 14th century as a response to the Black Death, whereas previously uh, these restrictions had been a bit more loose. Um, there was also a serious religious concern in regards to the disposal of bodies as well as to death uh, that arose during this time period. Uh, and this was something that was largely tackled and in, in some ways efficiently tackled by the Pope of the time, Pope Clement VI, as mentioned before. Um, there was a massive loss of life among much of the clergy, uh, both a higher, both the lower echelons, um, uh, such as, such as uh, monks and friars and priests and uh, low-level low clergymen, as well as high-level clergymen, right up to the, car the bishops and archbishops and cardinals, suffered insane casualties uh, as, due to the plague. And uh, as a result, they, um, resources were often stretched thin uh, for the Catholic Church. Uh, individuals were not available to grant people confessions as they lay dying. And um, this became a serious concern for many. Uh, otherwise, of course, many of the priests were simply too afraid to go out and take confessions because, once again, they were afraid of contracting the plague. And uh, the Pope sought to allay these fears, and um, I, th I think he, Pope Clement realized that it was the, this fear for one's immortal soul and um, fear of what could happen after dying was simply infusing more panic into the populace. Uh, and as a result, he did decree that um, 
as long as the person confessed and it didn't matter matter to who it was or even if it was to anybody in particular, they would be saved. And this was, I think, a shrewd decision to attempt to allay the panic. Uh, similarly, he also consecrated, for example, the River Rhone um, f in, for the for those who were for the bodies that were being disposed there. Uh, and I think these were sort of, while it might seem perhaps silly in a, in a more modern light, uh, these were sort of. Um, I think shrewd. This was sort. Of, this represented a sort of shrewd decision making from the Pope, and, and I think sound judgment in an effort to allay the fears that were being faced by much of the populace of various nations, which of course were being afflicted by the disease at the time. Um, however, the Pope was the Pope's efforts were not simply limited to spiritual affairs, and he also dealt with many of the more I think worldly problems of the plague. Um, and he, it was actually some of the Pope's decrees that would enable much of the medical research that stemmed from the Black Death. Uh, before I do jump into that medical research side of things, though, I do did want to mention one other, uh, one other effort the Pope made, and that was, I think, a significant one uh, at the time period. Because as we mentioned in the earlier portion of this video, one of the big issues, and this is not necessarily related to the medical aspect of things, or really to the um, sort of restriction quarantine side of things but uh, i do think that discussing all the pope's efforts here i think it's worth mentioning um as there was as we mentioned there were some significant pogroms um hundreds of jewish communities in europe found themselves annihilated and thousands of people were slain uh, and in the midst of these purges uh, the pope um, as well as his personal physician were some of the few individuals who actually stood up or some of the few individuals i should say in authority who stood up against these um, sort of acts of acts of incredible violence and brutality and the cruelty that were taking place, and uh, Pope Clement um, firmly rejected the notion that the Jews had anything to do with spreading the plague, uh, and this was something that he was backed on by his by once again his personal physician, um, and uh, he actually suggested that clergymen and priests and should actually shelter Jews who were being prosecuted, and he declared that those who were prosecuting the Jews were actually being influenced by the devil. So I think it does show a uh, sort of effort. Now, obviously, the Pope didn't necessarily have the power to do very much beyond that. Uh, oftentimes, civil authorities either enabled or turned a blind eye to these cruelties, uh, but I do think it is worth mentioning that he himself made an effort to uh, try to protect some of those innocents who were being um, prosecuted uh, brutally in, in the face of the plague. Uh, but finally, really turning to the more medicinal side of things, to the medical side of things, uh, the Pope made a rather um, significant decision here as well in the fact that he allowed for the dissection of bodies. Uh, it was realized that none of the wisdom of the ancients essentially was doing any good against the plague, that uh, the medical research from Greece in particular, uh, but also going back to Rome, and granted it was sort of falling out of favor at this point, but some of the uh, me medical knowledge from uh, the Middle East and Arabia and, and these areas, um, that was simply inadequate to combat the plague. And uh, the falling out of uh, non-Greco-Latin -Gre uh, medicine is somewhat something we could discuss at in a later video perhaps, but um, regardless, it was realized that it was not working and that new solutions were needed. And thus in 1348, Clement VI did authorize the dissection of dead bodies, hoping that surgeons and physicians would th thus be aided in their quest for curing the plague because it was a serious effort to try to defeat this disease. Unfortunately, this goal would never be realized. Uh, the plague would the plague would remain uncured until modern times uh, with modern day antibiotics. Uh, but it was a major step forward for medicine as a whole, uh, because the papal bull from Pope Boniface VIII, which had been declared in 1300, banning the dissection of bodies, was rescinded. And um, as a result of this, there was a sudden boom in new textbooks and materials covering the human body, um, its functions, the way the disease afflicted uh, the human body, and that sort of thing. Uh, and although ultimately this papal decision would be reversed by future popes, uh, it would not be... Uh, this would not occur before a lot of information was gleaned, and the stigma of dissecting bodies had kind of been broken. Uh, and as a result, the later bans were no longer as effective, really, as they had been previously. Um, and so, from there, one must really look at what advice the physicians and the surgeons gave individuals. Now, shockingly enough, one of the 
advices given by physicians was for people to flee. Um, and this was arguably a very bad move and it is, it is one that doesn't seem to have been covered doesn't seem to get quite as much coverage um, as some of the other massive as some of the other major mistakes that we mentioned earlier in the video that were made but I think it was certainly had a very deleterious effect because it allowed the plague to spread however it must be recognized that the physicians at the time they knew that their training and their knowledge was simply inadequate to combat the plague uh, some of them had even decided that yes it was in fact a punishment from God and they realized they could do nothing for the people afflicted and so they gave what they thought was their best recommendation and that was simply for people to flee the plague uh, now as mentioned this uh, was probably more counterproductive than anything, but I think it does give us a glimpse of the mentality at the time, uh, even among the supposed trained professionals, because the physicians were really the cream of the crop. Those were essentially the doctors of their day. Um, and so it, it does give us, I think, an eye into their mentality. Um, that said, um, the failure of physicians to combat the disease would have other other effects, and um, many of these were actually a positive or net positive for medicine in the long haul. Um, with once again, there was a clear failure of ancient works as well as theoretical medicine in providing a cure to the Black Death, and as a result, many individuals began searching for a more practical cure, cure or studies, uh, oftentimes enabled by this new. Uh, allowance to dissect bodies, um, studies searching to clarify some sort of solution or perhaps better understand how the plague afflicted the body and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the most significant advances here was that surgeons who had once been sort of a second class compared to physicians, they were considered sort of the second rate doctors, like not really fit for true medicine, um, not as well educated, uh, not as capable, they, this is sort of how they were viewed. These, these individuals began coming into their own. Uh, and they actually wrote tr many treatises on the human body and the way in which the plague afflicted it, and they provided a very practical first-hand view of things, uh, which was very important at the time. They weren't speaking from a purely sort of theoretical standpoint or speculating and spitballing on what may or may not have been. Uh, they were giving a much more hands-on approach. And also, because of the fact that many of these surgeons were not necessarily the best educated individuals, and this is not supposed to come across as they were stupid individuals or incompetent individuals necessarily, certainly not by the standards of the time, um, but they, these individuals oftentimes did not know Latin or their knowledge of Latin was limited, uh, and so they were not considered as educated, especially according to physicians. The result was this, was that much of the work they produced was produced in vernacular. Uh, languages rather than Latin. And this helped disseminate information in the common tongue of the land. It allowed more people access to this medical information to do with as they as they please or to learn from and uh, better educate themselves. Uh, obviously, illiteracy at the period was still very high, so it's unlikely that sort of a, the majority of the population perhaps would have read these texts. Um, and obviously, books themselves were pretty rare. And, and uh, these texts would have been, been rare themselves, but um, it did mean that accessibility was increased by a significant margin. And uh, this obviously had long-term impacts. In the long term, it would help medical professionals uh, sort of uh, improve their craft. Um, so that was one, those were some of the big contributions there to medicine uh, that, were that were granted by the Black Death. Um, now, obviously, in the long run, the Black Death would have massive, long-standing uh, societal effects. Um, it would impact how Europe handled plagues um, in the centuries to come. Uh, we saw, obviously, how, in, in, for example, the village of Eum, how many of these early approaches to handling the plague actually proved uh, effective. Uh, even while perhaps ruthless and um, resulting in high loss of life in the area where the plague took place, it ensured that the plague did not sort of run rampant, run rampant and cause exponentially greater amounts of damage. Um, it also showed that after, we also see here how after some, obviously some significant loss of life, uh, individuals began to be better educated on how the disease spread and greater precautions were taken on what items were being allowed to enter cities. Um, and uh, what products and whatnot were, were associated with the spread of the plague. Uh, so we do see these sorts of this sort of evolution stemming from Black Death.
And of course, as mentioned, uh, great advances were made, uh, or really enabled, I should say. It's not necessarily that the great advances were immediately made in medicine, but they were enabled by the research, by the texts, by the diagrams, by the dissections, and these things uh, that stemmed from the Black Death. Um, and they provided Europe, in the long run, with a uh, much improved approach to medicine. So that really does sum up this video. I do hope you guys found it uh, educational and hopefully informative and um, perhaps a bit interesting. Uh, if you did, as usual, don't hesitate to leave a like, subscribe, and share down below. If you have your own comments, critiques, questions, all that sort of thing, don't hesitate to put them down below. I will do my best to respond as soon as I can. Uh, I do thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next one. Bye for now.